Philippians chapter 3, beginning at verse 3, reading through verse 14. Here it is on the screen for those in the building today. The King James text today reads, For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus, listen to this, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things we get were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in Him not having mine own righteousness which is of the law but that which is through the faith of Christ the righteousness which is of God by faith that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Master, once again, God, we come before you, Lord. Grateful for the word of God. Grateful for the songs of Zion. The wonderful old hymns of the church that in and of themselves convey so much inspiration and so much blessing and so much uplifting. Master, now is the time that the Word of God must go forth. Lord, I have many things wrestling within my spirit today, trying to distract me, trying to disturb my peace, and trying, Lord, to interrupt the flow of the Holy Ghost. But I ask God right now in the name of Jesus, that every spirit of distraction in the name of my God, my Savior, my Redeemer, my King, Jesus the Christ, be bound and cast forth. Master, I claim liberty in the Holy Ghost, in my mind, in my spirit, in my heart today, that I might deliver the Word of God you've given me for the people of God at this hour. Help me, Lord, to deliver it in a manner that will bring glory to your name, for we ask it in none other than Jesus' precious name. 
Amen. Praise God and amen. In the third chapter of the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul starts out with the statement, For we are the circumcision. He is saying, Let me tell you who God's people really are. Let me tell you who those are who really, genuinely, sincerely qualify as those who have set themselves apart, as those who have embraced the promise of God and have circumcised their heart and not merely their flesh. He said, let me tell you who the real people of circumcision are. Therefore, let me tell you who the real people of God today are. We are the circumcision. Three things. One, which worship God in the Spirit. Honey, if all worship were in the Spirit, then what difference would there be if the way these folks worship, and the way those folks worship, and the way these folks, if the way Baptists worship, and the way Methodists worship, and the way Presbyterians worship is the same as the way Pentecostals worship, then why would Paul specify that part of what identifies people of the circumcision, people of God in truth, are those who do what? They worship God in the Spirit. Jesus told the woman at the well, the hour cometh and now is. God is the Spirit, and they that worship God must worship Him in spirit and in truth. But it was not possible before the day of Pentecost for God's people to worship God in spirit. The Spirit of God was not part and parcel. He was not part of the process of worship until after the day of Pentecost when God's people were filled with the Holy Ghost until God's Spirit literally occupied the life and the body and the being of of God's people. Now, full of the Holy Ghost, we have the ability to worship God in spirit. We're able to worship God from a place that goes so much deeper than merely our minds, merely our voice box, not even our heart. He doesn't say to worship God from the heart. There are many people out there, I'm sure, who worship God from their heart. But that's not what God's looking for. No, God's true people are people that know how to worship God in the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. That means their worship is worship that is born of the Holy Ghost. It's inspired by the Holy Ghost. It is... Uh, brought about by the intervention of the Holy Ghost. People make fun of us Pentecostal people. They like to talk about us shouting and dancing and running the aisles. Oh, their worship is so demonstrative. Their worship is crazy. It's lunacy. It's goofy. It's weird. They talk in tongues. They do all these things. Yeah, we do because we're worshiping God in the Spirit. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You can go to a ball game and get in the Spirit of a ball game and shout your full head off and nobody is supposed to think anything of it you can go to a hockey match and scream at the top of your lungs because some idiot knocks a little puck into a net past his opponent's goalkeeper nobody thinks anything of it but walk into a Pentecostal church and see God's people, hallelujah, getting excited, getting in the Spirit, getting excited about Jesus, getting excited about salvation. Oh, shouting when they sing about the cross, dancing when they sing about deliverance, running the aisles when they sing about liberty. Oh, shouting at the top of their lungs when they talk. And they're a bunch of kooks and nuts 
well nuts on you God's looking for people who know how to worship him in spirit I'm going to tell you something Pentecostal that's watching me right now y'all most of y'all done lost it most Pentecostal churches today are as dead and as dry in their worship as any, God forgive me, any Baptist, Methodist, or Episcopalian, Presbyterian church you go into, you don't see that Pentecostal distinctive in worship in most Pentecostal churches today. You've gotten so caught up in preaching politics. You've gotten so caught up in preaching Donald Trump. You got so caught up in preaching culture wars. You should have been preaching Jesus. You should have been preaching the crucifixion. You should have been preaching the resurrection. You should have been preaching uh, the Lord ascending. You should have been preaching the promise of his return. You should have been preaching the infilling of the Holy Ghost. On the day of Pentecost, you should have been preaching Acts 2 38. You should have been preaching Jesus' name baptism. You should have been preaching the infilling of the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking with other tongues. You should have been preaching divine healing and deliverance, but you're so busy preaching garbage. You hadn't stopped long enough to realize we don't have the move of God we used to have. Why? I'll tell you why. Because the anointing of the Holy Ghost only accompanies truth. Mm -hmm. Jesus said the Father seeks those who worship Him, listen to me, in spirit and in truth if you're not preaching the truth if you're not teaching the truth if you're not singing the truth you're going to kill the spirit that's why the apostle paul warned us quench not the holy spirit of god what does that mean that means we have the ability to put god's fire out in the midst of us you start preaching Trump and the fire goes out. You start preaching politics and the fire goes out. You start preaching republicanism and the fire goes out. You start preaching uh, social issues and the fire goes out. You start preaching culture war and the fire goes out. All of a sudden the Holy Ghost is not moving in the midst of you anymore like the Holy Ghost used to move. I know I'm telling the truth. I know I am. I grew up in this thing. But one of the earmarks of those who can genuinely identify as circumcised in the heart, not just in the flesh, those who qualify as God's true people, Paul said, are those who worship in spirit. He goes on to say there's another item that identifies us. He said, who rejoice in Christ Jesus. Oh, I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> when I was part of the Riverside Church of God in Fort Worth, Texas, years ago, a church that used to experience an old-time Pentecostal move of God like few churches I ever saw until then and since then. I'll tell you, Brother Gillum, oh, I'm telling you, they get, they get to talking about Jesus. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I met a lady at a gas station one time. I began to help her, you know. And she was an older woman and I began to help her. She was having trouble working the pump and getting her credit card to work and everything. I said, ma'am, I'm a minister. May I help you with your pumping your gas? Let me help you. She said, if you don't mind, and I did. And the first word, she said, oh, you're a minister. You're a Christian minister. I said, yes, ma'am. First words off her lips. Boy, I'll tell you what, that Obama 
And I looked at her and I said, which Assemblies of God church do you attend? Because I knew just as sure as shooting. She was Assemblies of God. She said, oh, I go to First Assembly right down the street. I didn't even have to ask her what church she went to. But you know, one of the things about the church of God I used to love, it ain't true today, but it used to be, it was different even than the church I grew up in, even though the church I grew up in wasn't as bad as they are now. But I came to Texas as a teenager, 16-year-old boy, and I'm going to tell you something. You ask any church of God saint, how are you today? And they're going to say, oh, I'm blessed. Thank God for Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm going to tell you, you can eat. Oh, my God. You got to talking to somebody from Riverside, and you told them, I'm a preacher. I'm a believer. I'm Pentecostal like you. I'm full of the Holy Ghost like you. And honey, at the gas pump, you're likely to have a tongue talking, dancing, shouting jubilee right there at the gas pump. Why? Because we weren't all caught up in all this of the garbage. We rejoiced in Christ Jesus. Man, all we had to do was start talking about the Lord. Next thing you know, I may tell you the old saints would be bop, 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 and bop, 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 and I'm not kidding. I'm not even joking. They'd be at the gas pump shouting. They'd be in the middle of the convenience store beginning to talk in tongues and getting happy in the Holy Ghost. Because their whole aim was to rejoice in Christ Jesus. Well, I'm going to tell you, that's what identifies the circumcision. That's what identifies a true saint of God. One who worships in spirit. One who rejoices in Christ Jesus. Listen. And one who has no confidence, no confidence, not a little bit, not very little confidence, not a small amount of confidence, has no confidence, Paul said, in the flesh. Remember, uh, there's a video on YouTube I love to watch. It's a little old lady at a Church of God camp meeting many years ago. I mean, this little old lady, she got to be in her 80s. They asked her to get up and sing at camp meeting. She plays guitar. She gets up and she starts apologizing. She hadn't played her guitar in a while, you know. Starts apologizing. She may not play real good. She said, my singing may not be the best because I don't sing real good these days, but I'll probably sing worse in another couple of years. And she says... She said, you know a song I'm about to so She starts singing this song. There's a land of pure delight over there where our faith is lost in sight over there. There no sorrow enters in, no sickness and no sin. Oh my God, there's a golden crown to win over there. And during the course of this song, they mention any number of God's people over the years. From the Word of God, it talks about Elijah, it talks about Noah, it talks about Miriam and her tambourine, it talks about all these old saints. And at one point, this old lady stops singing in the middle of her song. She said, you know, she said, I don't even feel right. I don't even feel like I should be singing about these dear old saints said, I'm not in the same, I'm not in the same category, I'm not in the same place as these wonderful old saints. She said, oh, but I still plan on being over there by the help and grace of God. Didn't sound like that little old lady had a whole lot of confidence in the flesh. She was holiness. She had her long hair piled up on her head. She had on long sleeves and long dresses and closed-toed shoes and had her stockings on. God forbid we go without stockings. And yet still, she said, by the grace of God, I'll meet these saints over there. Am I telling the truth? You see, that's why she didn't say, well, I'm doing everything I can so I can make heaven. Hallelujah. I'm not cutting my hair. I'm wearing the longest sleeves I can wear. I'm wearing the longest skirts I can wear. Glory to God. So I can make heaven. I've heard 
garbage like that from people. But the circumcision, those who genuinely qualify as God's people, are those who worship God in the Spirit, those who rejoice in Christ Jesus, not in who lost or won an election. That's right. And those who have no confidence, none, zero, zilch, nada, nine, confidence in the flesh. Then Paul goes on to say in our primary text today, if anybody could have confidence in the flesh, if salvation did rely upon compliance with the law of Moses, and he goes down the list and he talks about all the ways that he would qualify. Because he said, you know, as it pertains to the law, I was a Pharisee. When it comes to being born a Jew, well, I was born a Jew of the stock of Benjamin's tribe. You see what I'm saying? He's breaking down and saying, hey, if all it is in being part of the circumcision is about being a Jew, he said, honey, I qualify in spades. And he gave all the, all the requirements and he gave all the ways that would in the flesh would make him qualify. By the end of his comments, he says, but you know what? He said, I've given all that up. None of that means nothing to me anymore. He said, I don't give a flying fig about one of those things. All of that is nothing but a pile of dung to me now. So that I might attain Christ. See, see you can't have your confidence there and have your confidence in Christ at the same time. So in order to attain Christ, you got to let that crap go. Pardon the pun. He called it crap. I didn't. He said, I count it as dung. What do you think dung is? He said, I leave all that garbage behind so that I might attain Christ. Hallelujah. We got Christians, got one hand in a pile of manure and the other hand reaching for Jesus. And they don't understand as long as you got one hand in that pile of manure, you can't attain Christ. Because you can't have both. You can't be trying to satisfy the law and at the same time experience the full benefit of grace. It doesn't work that way. Got people in the church run around today thinking they've convinced themselves because they follow all the rules and they live up to all the standards that the United Pentecostal Church has set forth. Or back in the day, they live up to all the standards set forth in the practical commitment section of the Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee. Statement of faith, and I was one of those people at one time. They think because they follow all these rules and regulations that they've got a leg up on heaven. Oh, they've got the advantage. They're going to make glory long before you do. Man, we used to sit, I didn't, but people did in the holiness movement. They loved to sit and look at Tammy Faye and judge her up one side, down the other, because she'd be on TV with her makeup and all this. And all they just judge her. Ignore the fact she was the most graceful, the most godly, the sweetest spirited, the most loving Christian woman on the planet. Ignore all that. Because after all, heaven is all about whether or not you wear makeup, whether or not you wear jewelry, whether or not you cut your hair. That's what's going to make the difference between heaven or hell. Used to look at somebody like Vestal Goodman, one of the most godly, decent, kind, generous, sweet-spirited, loving Christian ladies on the planet. Had a testimony worldwide for being just incredibly, incredibly loving and precious of spirit. Look at somebody like her. Well, she used to be one of us, but glory to God, now she cuts her hair and she wears them pan outfits and wears her some earrings and, and blah, 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 blah. Now 
she's headed to hell. Oh, but I've got a leg up because I don't do all those things. Hallelujah. Honey, you are not of the circumcision because you still put confidence in the flesh. Paul said, the true circumcision, those who are truly God's people, have no confidence in the flesh. None. Zero. Zilch. They don't think they're going to make heaven. Listen to me, LGBT believer. They don't think they're going to make heaven because somehow they went through a program and straightened themselves. Because if you think that's the only way you're going to get into heaven, then you're putting your confidence where? Flesh. In the flesh. You're certainly not putting it in the grace of God. If you think you've got to change who you are, if you think somehow or another you've got to find the ability to become something you're not, because if you don't, you're going to be lost and headed to a devil's hell. If that's the way you think and that's the way you believe, and if you've done something in order to accommodate that way of thinking. Got news for you, honey. You've put confidence in the flesh, not in the grace of God. See, I know as an LGBT pastor, I know as an LGBT believer, I know when I make heaven, it's going to be because of the grace of God. It's not going to be because I lived up to some rule. Not going to be because I did something special. Not going to be because I was able to change who I am. No, none of those things matter because God isn't asking us to do those things. He's asking us to trust Him. He's asking us to believe Him. He's asking us to take Him at His Word. He's asking us to let the promises of His Word be sufficient to satisfy our faith. Am I telling the truth today? Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, there is an old gospel song from many years ago which says, Tell Him when you saw me. I was on my way. I was climbing up that mountain to the land of endless day. My face was toward the sunrise and the shadows all behind. Tell him when you saw me, I was on my way. The Apostle Paul said in our primary text today, he said, all these things are behind me. I've let them all go. They're dumb to me that I might attain Christ. But then he turns around and says, it's not as though already I had attained, however. So I let those things go, but at the same time, that doesn't mean I've already achieved perfection. That doesn't mean that I've already achieved holiness. That doesn't mean that I've already achieved my goal of being Christ-like. And he goes on to say that that goal is reserved for the resurrection. He said that goal won't be achieved in this life. That goal will be achieved in the resurrection. He said, therefore, my goal is simply to hold fast to my faith until the resurrection. Mm -hmm. He said, my goal is to make sure that I participate in the resurrection because the perfection and the holiness that God has promised will come at the resurrection. So it's not as though I've already achieved. It's not as though I've already been perfected because I haven't, obviously. That's not going to happen till the resurrection. He said, in the meantime, I press on. I keep pushing toward the mark, toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. When you see the Lord, if you should get to heaven before me, tell the Lord, I'm on my way. Hallelujah. Oh, my God, have mercy. I haven't got there yet, Jesus. But I'm on my way. That's the direction I'm headed in. Oh, many Christians speak of heaven as their destination. They claim their goal is to make that place their final eternal home. But here in Philippians chapter 3, the Apostle Paul makes clear that our goal and our destination is not a place, but rather it is a state of being. We ought not yearn or strive for heaven, but rather we ought to long for that eventual state of holiness. 
and sinless new, uh, sinlessness which the Lord has promised those of us who love Him. Too many are content with this world and they're satisfied with life as it is. They do not mourn the fact they exist in a sinful state. They do not mourn the fact that they exist within a sinful, ungodly existence. They don't long for the eventual state of holiness and sinless perfection which the Lord has promised those who look for His coming. Too many are content with this world. They're satisfied with this life. Too many Christians are so happy to be here that the thought of death scares them to death. Why on earth? Now I'm not saying Christians ought to run out and you know, get themselves run over by trolley cars so they can go to heaven. But at the same time, when, when the time comes to go, there ain't nothing to be afraid of. You ought to go gladly. You ought to go gleefully. You ought to go with a smile on your face and a song in your heart because you know there's better things to come. If you think this old polluted world, this godless, ungodly world, this world where a group of people in one country like the United States of America, this group of people who who do not constitute the majority and they know they don't constitute the majority are trying to manipulate elections and control populations so that they can gain the advantage in government so they can rule everything and run the poor out of town and let the sick die if you think this stinking world is so wonderful and so fantastic that you've got to rail against death then honey, you and I have a very different understanding of heaven and a very different understanding of death and a very different understanding of the rewards that await us when this life is over. We used to sing the song in the church. We still sing it here, but a lot of churches don't. Oh, I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. We're actually celebrating when the hour of our death comes. That's what that song does. It is celebrating. I'm going to die one day. Hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! One day I'm going to die. Oh, hallelujah, by and by. One day I'm going to die. Hallelujah, by and by. One day I'm going to die. Hallelujah, by and by. Yes. I'll fly away. My we Christians look like a pile of lunatics, don't we? When death doesn't scare the life out of us. We're not trying to change the world we're in because we have no intention of staying in the world we're in. We're not afraid of persecution because God's promised that He delivers from all. Am I telling the truth? Right. We're not afraid of all the things that preachers and false prophets and false preachers have been preaching and teaching and telling us for decades. We're not afraid of those things. We're not the least bit worried about them. I don't need to change what's happening in my country. I don't need to change the moral climate or what's going on. I don't need to change a bloody thing because I serve a God who's bigger than all of it. Amen. But see, they say that, Tommy. Mm -hmm. but they don't mean it. Mm -hmm. Their actions clearly, clearly, beyond the shadow of a doubt, clearly demonstrate they're full of dung. They don't believe one word they're saying. Oh, we're going to be persecuted. Oh, this is going to happen. Oh, that's going to happen. We got to change things. We got to change things. Yeah. You know what? You better change things because when the trumpet blows, honey, you'll still be here. Take my word for it because you're not part of the true circumcision. My Lord, have mercy. Preacher, you sure do tell it plain. Yeah, I do. That way, when you stand before God in the judgment, you just try and tell Him you never heard it said. You just try to tell the Lord. Nobody ever warned me, Lord. He'll say, listen, I know you heard Burnett Mara down there, and honey, they, one of my servants told it straighter than he did. 
Don't you stand here and tell me you never heard you were going to wind up in the devil's hell because your confidence was in the flesh. Don't you tell me you never heard you're going to wind up in the devil's hell because you lived in fear rather than by faith. Don't you tell me that you didn't understand you'd wind up in the devil's hell because you loved this world more than you loved me. You were more concerned with changing the world you lived in than simply holding on to your faith till you got to the new one. Mm -hmm. They don't mourn the sinful existence we live in today. Oh, but I want to tell you that ought to be the cry of our heart today. The cry of our heart ought to be, Oh God, I cannot wait until that moment when we are translated from this life into your sinless perfection. Oh my goodness, if our goal is heaven, we may never arrive there. I hope you heard what I just said. If our goal is heaven, you may never get to heaven. Why? Because to make heaven our home, we must not long for heaven or even those happy reunions with friends and loved ones who've gone on before us, but rather we ought to yearn for that state of holiness which the Lord has promised those who love and serve Him. In 1 John 2, 15-17, the word of the Lord reads, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now how much plainer can you make it? For all that is in the world. Now, what, now watch this. He doesn't list things. Homes and wives and money and riches. No, 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 no. Listen to what he says are in the world. This is Jesus speaking. For all that is in... I'm sorry, John the Apostle John is speaking. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes, meaning the desire to have things and the desire constantly seeing things you want to have that you have to have, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but, it, but is of the world. Oh my, John. So you're not talking, when you say love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, you're not talking about loving things in the sense of things you can lay your hands on. You're talking about the attitudes the desires, the way of looking at things that you find in the world. That's what he's talking about. Oh, I'm telling you, oh, I just heard about half the Christians in the fundamentalist and evangelical church today. I just heard them fall into the pit of hell because I guarantee you they love the attitudes of the world. They're as, they're as selfish. They're so full of pride. They are so full of self-will. They are so full of, full of selfishness and greed like the world. And yet, John said anybody who loves the world more than they love, that loves the world, I'm sorry, cannot have the love of God in him. He said those two things cannot exist side by side. You can't have the love of God and the love of the world in the same room. One of them is going to beat the other one up. Well, I got news for you. God don't get beat up. He'll just get up and walk away. You want to love the world? See you around. Have a party. You want to love the world? Fine. You enjoy it while you're here. Because after death, guess what? You ain't going to be with me. You don't qualify. He said, and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But, the biggest word in the Bible, B-U-T. But he that doeth the will of God abideth 
forever. What is the will of God? That you not love the world. Neither the things that are in the world. That's the will of God. In Romans chapter 8 verses 20 through 23 the word of God states, For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, awaiting, excuse me, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. So the writer tells us in Romans, Paul tells us in Romans, he says, God created us to be subject unto vanity. What is vanity? Vanity is to be subject unto those things which profit nothing, that don't profit anything. You know, our, our lust and our desires and our will and half the time, half of what we do really doesn't amount to a hill of beans. As far as God's concerned, it don't amount to a hill of beans. You ain't accomplishing nothing. That's why the writer in the Old Testament book of wisdom said, vanity, vanity, all is vanity. Virtually everything humanity does is just vanity. It doesn't amount to a hill of beans, really. I've got a cousin on the Cape, my cousin Pee Wee, bless her heart. She cracked me up so bad this week. We were up there. She's a, she's a, I'll tell you what, bless her. You talk about somebody speaks her mind, you know, but, but I mean, she doesn't speak it in a hateful or nasty way, but she's funny. She said, you know, have you ever thought about how stupid we are? Have you honestly, have you ever really thought about as human beings just how dumb and stupid we are? She said, man, I've bought things. I've been on a trip and I bought some little gadget, you know, as a, as a keepsake of my trip to this place or that place. She said, three years later, I'm looking at that thing and I'm thinking, what kind of idiot were you to buy that? I said, now, now it's just sitting there gathering dust. You could have bought some little old magnet for the refrigerator and it would have reminded you of your trip there. But oh no! you had to buy this little dumb lighthouse thing and now it's just sitting there gathering dust and I can't do nothing with it I don't have room for it I don't know what to do with the thing I wasted all kinds of money on it. she said my God when I look back and I think about all the garbage I've bought over the course of my life all the money I wasted she said I can't help but think how stupid are you isn't that the truth it's vanity that's what the word vanity means. You know, it's just, it's useless. It's all useless. So much of what we do in this life is useless. There's an old saying I heard when I was a child. I always loved this saying, and I've tried to live by it as much as I was able in this life. It says, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's why Jesus said, lay up your treasures on the other side, where dust and moth doth not corrupt, and thieves cannot break in and steal. How many of us live our lives as though everything in this life is, you know, it's all, it's all right while it's there, but honey, I'll leave it in a flash second. The minute I hear the trumpet, I'll leave with a smile on my face, because I don't care about all this mess. How many of us live our lives as though there's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun? How many of us live our lives as though we're trying to lay up treasures in heaven? Because the Lord said He's going to reward every man according to His work. How many of us help the poor? 
How many of us help the needy? How many of us are a blessing to the elderly or to those who are disabled? How many of us do remember the message I preached a while back on works, you know, good works, and how God has called us to good works? How many of us really do good works knowing that one day in glory we're going to be paid? God ain't going to let one single deed go unrewarded. How many of us live our lives like that? I don't say this, please, don't misunderstand. I'm not saying this to toot my own horn. I'm trying to illustrate my message. I was on the plane coming home from Boston. I arrived at Dallas DFW Airport. Flight attendant got on the loudspeaker. She said, folks, for those of you awaiting chair assist, which I require chair assist when I'm flying because I cannot walk an airport. It's too much for me. Uh, said all of you who are waiting chair lift a uh, chair assist she said uh, there's about six or seven folks she said well the chairs have not arrived yet she said so please feel free to stay on the plane and as they become available we'll let you know well i was blocking a fella in i was in the middle seat i was blocking i, I didn't want to stay in my seat and block him in you know so i said well i'll get out i'll walk down the front of the plane i'll sit one of the front seats, and then I'll wait for the chairs to come. So I went down there, and I sat in one of the front seats, and people, of course, are getting off the plane. And I said to the, the, the airline stewardess, I, we used to call them stewardesses back in the day, to tell you how old I am, flight attendant. The flight attendant, I told the flight attendant, I said, listen, anybody that's, that's on this plane that's waiting on a chair, if they're making a connected flight, go ahead and take them. I said, I can wait. I can wait. I said, I'm, I live here. My partner's in the parking lot. He can wait a few minutes. He ain't gonna. He won't even know I did this, so it ain't gonna kill him to wait a few extra minutes. I said, we'll wait. I said, you just let the connected people get off and get a chair, because I've flown for years and years. You know, I'm 50. I'll be 57 next month. I know what it is to, you know, be pressed for time and you're trying to get your connected flight, you know. So anyway, this lady said, oh man, you're a peach. She said, thank you so much. Eh, no problem. What does it kill me? What does it kill me? We got Christians in the world today, man, they'd be the first one. Well, I was here first. Bless God, I ought to be able to take that chair because after all, I was here first. You know. Why? Why in God's green earth can't we be different? We're supposed to be in the world, but we're not supposed to be of the world. We're not supposed to be like the world. We're supposed to live different. We're supposed to act different. We're supposed to be different. I said, no, let him take it. Don't you know everybody on that plane but me nearly was there for him. Was to, I don't know about the first person or two because they got their chair before I got down the front of the plane. But everybody that was left on the plane had a had a connection, you know. So I wound up being the last person in the flight attendant said, "Thank you so much." I said, "Honey, listen, I've, I've traveled way too much, and I'm telling you, I, I know what it feels like to be pushing to try to get to a plane, you know, a connection, and I, I don't want to put anybody through that." I said, "I'm happy to do it." Oh, I want to tell you today, folks, listen to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 through 56. Yes. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we all shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall all be and we shall be changed. For this corruptible, notice he doesn't say this corruption, meaning it's already corrupted. He said, for this corruptible, meaning we can be corrupted. Mm -hmm. Said so this corruptible must put on incorruption. So in other words, we got to turn this steel that we are today into stainless steel. Did you hear me? We got to turn this steel into stainless steel. 
Why? Well, because stainless steel doesn't rust. You hear me now? So stainless steel is incorruptible. Do you understand me? So that's what Paul's saying. He said, we've got to, our nature has to be changed. Has to be changed from a nature that can corrupt to a nature that cannot corrupt. It's got to go from a nature that can rust to a nature that cannot rust. From a nature that can rot and turn to dust to a nature that cannot rust, uh, excuse me, rot and turn to dust. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality, meaning this which can die must put on that which cannot die. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. What gives sin its power is the law. But Jesus delivered us from the law. So therefore, the sting of death no longer has power over us. Hebrews 12, 14, Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. One cannot desire to be somewhere. Listen to me today, folks. One cannot desire to be somewhere if they're already convinced they've arrived there. You can't get an individual with dementia to get excited about going home if they already believe they're home. Oh Mary, are you excited about going home? I am home. But there's my clock. There's my bird. There's my favorite towel. There's, you know what I'm saying? You can't get them excited about home because they already think they are home. A lot of Christians are demented. They already think they're perfect. They already think they're sinless. They already think they're heaven ready. You ain't going to be heaven ready till you hear the trumpet not one minute before. You can't long for holiness and perfection if you've already convinced yourself that you're holy and perfect. In our primary text today, the Apostle Paul made abundantly clear that he was fully aware of his imperfection. He said, I hadn't already achieved, I hadn't already attained, I hadn't already got there. As it's defined by the law of Moses, in fact, he said he considered all the rules, the regulations, the achievements, and the accomplishments that he had in the flesh to have all been laid down and discarded as dung so that he might instead become the servant and the possession of Christ Jesus. He begins his statements in our primary text today saying, that a true Jew is one who is now able to worship God in the Spirit who celebrates Jesus Christ and who puts no confidence, none, in the flesh. Lord, I'll tell you what. Jesus, tell you what. I know I had not got there. I, a matter of fact, I'm more sure of that every day. <laughs> Every day I, I think, oh Lord, I'm, I, I just know I'm so far from the goal. But thank you, Jesus, I'm on my way. Hallelujah. I'm on my way. <laughs> I haven't got there, Lord, but I'm on my way. Because I'll tell you what, I'm going to hold on to this faith. I'm going to keep believing. I'm going to keep putting my trust and confidence in your word and in the promises of your word. I'm going to just keep trusting you, putting my confidence in your grace, not in my ability to do or be anything. I'm going to put my confidence in your grace. 
so that I will qualify for the resurrection. And qualifying for the resurrection, that means I'll be guaranteed that I'll achieve what I'm looking for. And that is sinless perfection. Because Lord, if heaven were a shack on the other side of the universe, and there were not streets of gold, and there were not gates of pearl, that'd be all right with me so long as you were there. And so long as the world I'm going to doesn't look or smell or act anything like the world I'm living in now. Hallelujah. This old sinful, ungodly, evil, wicked world, people fighting with each other, trying to control one another, trying to manipulate and, and gain wealth at the expense of other people's lives and livelihoods. Lord, I'm all too happy to go to a place where that which today is corruptible, there will not be corruptible. That which today is mortal, there will not be mortal. That which today cannot possibly lay eyes upon the God of all creation according to the promise of your word, there will be able to look upon you. The Bible said we shall see him as he is. Hallelujah. If Adam and Eve could enjoy the Lord coming to the Garden of Eden and walking with them, the Bible said, in the cool of the day, and then after their nature changed, after they disobeyed God, they hid from Him. Well, there must have been some sort of a physical manifestation of God that they were hiding from. Otherwise, if, if God was everywhere, you know, they would know there's no way you can hide from Him. But there was some sort of, well, when Moses asked to see God, what did the Lord tell him? He said, no, Moses, you can't see me. If you were to see me, you'd drop dead. Your body would fall to the ground dead. But see, Adam and Eve were in the state prior to the fall that we're going to be in after the resurrection. So we'll be able once again to see the Lord as He is. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I haven't yet arrived. But thank you, Jesus, because of your grace, because of your mercy, because of your love, because of what you did for me at Calvary. I can say today by faith, with confidence. I'm on my way. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Amen. I was